Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Greetings, gentle listeners. Jim Hannock here with co-host Mario Ramos-Reyes and dear friend Christy Yao. Today, our special guest is Skylar Kovic, chair of the National Committee of the American Solidarity Party. We'll have lots of questions for him, but we begin with a prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you will renew the face of the earth. Lord, by the light of the Holy Spirit, you have taught the hearts of your faithful in the same spirit. Help us to relish what is right and always rejoice in your consolation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Before we begin to ply Schuyler with questions, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to talk about why it is on this uh, WCAT, Radio Catholic uh, Network of Stations, we're talking politics, and in fact, we're talking party politics. Why is that? Well, there are lots and lots of reasons. Uh, First reason is that if we're going to have social justice, if we're going to have a culture of life, we have to engage in politics and we have to, at least in our current culture, engage in party politics. The teaching church's view of this is that, uh, yes, that's what we got to do. And in particular, apart from extreme circumstances in particular, this is the specific role of lay people. Now, it's not as if somehow the station endorsed the American Solidarity Party, but this particular program, the Open Door, does endorse the American Solidarity Party and we do so wholeheartedly. In doing so, we can't help but think of Pope Francis's call for the laity to be more engaged in political efforts than in the past. And we can't help but think of the whole range of social commentators who call our attention to the pivotal role of civil society. We can understand civil society as the whole range of institutions, large, medium, and small, that come in between the state and the individual. And we have to have a rich and reflective civil society, and we think that the American Solidarity Party is making a critical contribution to civil society. Now, as always, there are historical parallels to what we're doing, and it's already a, 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 a call to, to pick this uh, historical parallel rather than that. But I want to mention two in particular. When the Roman empire began to fall apart, and when it continued to fall apart, and when it then crashed ingloriously and disastrously, uh, there was this fellow, Benedict, who organized uh, a whole group of people, 
And the idea was the least we could have for those dark times, the, the abbeys of the Benedictine order in which culture continued and in which culture was uh, developed and from which culture then spread. Fast forward to our time, uh, one noted commentator is saying that we have to revisit the Benedict option because engagement in the larger political order is, is perhaps fruitless. Well, that's not our view, but we understand that we can never lose the lessons that Benedict taught us. Another historical precedent, after the bloodletting, the catastrophic disaster of World War II, uh, which in, in some ways pitted fascism uh, against uh, communism, uh, against a kind of splintered uh, Western democracy, in the countries of Europe especially, there was need to rethink how to, how to construct a political order. Most everything was in ashes. And that was certainly the case in Italy. And in Italy, it was especially so that the Christian democratic movement developed and offered to uh, Italian politicians trying to reconstruct a, a political order, offered to them a set of principles, nothing ready-made, but a set of guiding principles. And a, a key figure in this offer of Christian democracy to Italy, and not only to Italy, but to, to France and Germany as well, was Jacques Maritain. And Jacques Maritain and Christian democracy in general are, are, are sources for reflection that, that, that we, we keep in mind. So there's my apologia for our being resolutely political and trying to be political in the best sense, of having a regard for the common good. That said, as we say, that said, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Skylar Kovic a lead question, and then uh, I'm going to strongly encourage Mario and Christy to uh, join in, in a whole range of questions, some of which we have in front of us and some of which will occur spontaneously. First of all, Skylar, how about politics within the American Solidarity Party. Uh, I understand that there are a number of crucial votes coming up within the party, and of course, those votes are scheduled the way they are to lead the party into the campaign for POTUS, President of the United States of America uh, status. Skyler, can you get us started here? All right. Uh, thanks for having me on the program, and I'll try to explain all of the upcoming events as simply as I can. So uh, at the end of June, there's going to be an online election for a uh, national committee, uh, as well as a referendum on whether to have another convention to open up the platform. Uh, which would be in September, as well as delegates for that convention, uh, if over half of the of the uh, members who vote decide to open up the platform. Uh, and in September, uh, if that passes, we will have that convention to open up the platform, uh, which will be done by the uh, 28 delegates who who win that delegate election. There are about 50 candidates, I believe and 28 of them will win. Uh, also in September, regardless of what happens in June, we are going to choose our presidential candidate, which uh, will be done by ranked choice voting, as well as our uh, vice presidential candidate. Uh, so for the national committee elections, uh, I'll talk about that a little bit less, because unfortunately, uh, if you're not already a voting member, it's uh, too late to be. Uh, the, the National Committee passed a motion earlier this year that you have to be 
a you have to have been a, a voting member for two months in order to uh, vote in elections. Uh, so if you if you were a voting member and your membership has expired, uh, or, uh, you can renew. But uh, it is in 2017 the uh, the party passed a motion uh, requiring dues to be paid in order to vote, and uh, so that has you know if if you were a voting member after that you can renew, but if you were not a voting member uh, after that time, you can't vote in the national committee elections now. However, you can join the party uh, in order to vote in the September presidential elections if you do that by early July, by, by July 6th, I believe. So the, uh, the national committee elections, there are nine candidates, uh, including myself and uh, Christy Yao, who's on this program. Uh, the so, so I, I joined the national committee in 2016. Uh, shortly after joining the party, actually during our, our first uh, presidential campaign, and then I was reelected for a two-year term in 2017, uh, chosen chair by the national committee last year, and I did decide to uh, run again. Uh, uh, you know, there was a, a difficult decision. I, I you know really thought about it long and hard. It's, you know, it could be argued that I should take a break and I am actually the longest serving member of the National Committee. But I thought that because of that, it would be good for me to be on there in order to help facilitate the relationship between the party and whoever our, uh, our presidential uh, ticket is. Uh, so also for National Committee, we have uh, Zebulon Bexelli, who is uh, uh, who is running for uh, or, or who who is the treasurer right now? Uh, Christopher Hunt, who's on the national committee. Uh, Christy Yao, who is uh, uh, like I said here on the program, and then Bryce Worgan and Carter McNeese, who are two active party members in North Carolina, and. Uh, James Trebear, uh, a, a you know much newer party member, and let's see, there's uh, a couple of other candidates. Uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, Alex Rasmussen, who's been a, a really active party member from Illinois, is uh, also another one. Now, the uh, presidential candidates, uh, I think you've already heard of on, on this. Oh, sorry, uh, on this program, uh, Brian Carroll, Joshua Perkins, and Joe Schreiner. Uh, Brian and Joshua are also running for vice president. And so people can vote for them by ranked choice voting in September. Quite a lineup. Quite uh, a yeah. lineup. Yes, a lot going on. Uh, oh, and also we have uh, a mayoral candidate. Uh, running in Georgia. So in addition to our presidential campaign, we do have one candidate for local office, and that election will be in the fall. Mario, what question would you uh, turn turn our yes. attention to? Yes, I have a, a question, and after that, I, I have a follow-up follow question. Um, how do you see, Skyler, the growth of the of the party uh, over the past, let's say, two years? Uh, there have been a significant amount of challenges. Uh, we, we haven't grown as much between 2017 and 2019 as we did in 2016. Uh, but that being said, we do have quite a few accomplishments, which have uh, you know, shown that we're a durable organization. Uh, <clears throat> we've had several candidates run for office, especially in uh, uh, in 2017. Monica Solar ran for New Jersey legislature. In 2018, we had uh, a candidate run for city council in California, in, in uh, Wisconsin, as well as uh, four candidates in California who were all on this show. Uh, 
two for Congress, one for governor, and one for city council. Uh, I think we did a lot to, uh, you know, plot our direction and some of the, the organizational uh, norms within the party. And we, we pretty much have verified that we are going to run a presidential candidate. And so the test is going to be how many volunteers and how effective can those volunteers be uh, as far as getting a presidential candidate on the ballots of as many states as possible. Uh, and so we're also hoping that during that process, we'll be able to get more durable you know, local chapters, which will recruit more candidates for office. So this is going to be a turning point. Now, one other thing that I've been focusing on a lot is uh, media strategy. And so I call it a, a two-way media strategy, in effect, is part of what we're doing is uh, getting people to contribute to our blog uh, on the party website, which expands the ideas that uh, we have coming out in the party in a way that's more permanent than social media discussion. Uh, and so what that does, so for example, uh, we had uh, John Whitehead, president of the Consistent Life Network, uh, writing for the blog, and uh, John Madai, who's a distributist author. Uh, and so they might be thought of as coming from two different wings of the party, but I think they, they actually agree uh, you know, on in most respects. And so having those people write for the blog, just as two examples, uh, you know, encourages their following to be confident in the party. And I think there's been already a, a couple of uh, ways in which the blog has encouraged people to cover us in the media. So for example, I was interviewed by uh, Charlie Comacy in Crux Magazine, which is actually He's uh, actually on the board of Democrats for Life, and he he gave me an interview. Uh, and then we were also just covered in the week by a, a, a conservative-leaning journalist named Matthew Walther, who has been supportive of the party but hadn't really given an entire story about us. Uh, so those sorts of, uh, you know, creating ourselves as, as a media source uh, and, and, a, and a blog while also uh, using Twitter and personal connections that I've made through Facebook and email and phone calls and all sorts of things, all, all sorts of ways of communicating. To... So, I'm sorry I'm interrupting you, but uh, yeah. I'm curious about this. You are giving me uh, or giving us uh, uh, a very uh, broad account of uh, the effort made by the party to reach to people, so using uh, media strategies and the like, or maybe visible the party. Right. Uh, so, but when you look at the history of many movements, uh, and Jean mentioned about the Christian Democratic Party, they did not trust in that first. Rather, they formed first a movement, a movement which came out of some attraction, some ideals that move people first, and then they're starting thinking about strategy. My question today is, well, uh, many people may know the American Solidarity Party, but they may not feel any attraction to it because their heart is not there. Is there any way by which the party become at the same time a movement which can bring people from different uh, path of life and and be attracted to it, to the ideals, to the proposal, and and then any strategy will be secondary. Because what I'm seeing is that, yes, we trust too much on technology, visibility, media strategies, but yet there is something that may be missing there, which is the ideals, the passion that anyone can feel through a human experience in that sense, I think. Given the tradition of the American Solidarity Party, all the Christian Democrat the movement began with a passion first. What do you say about that? 
Right. Yeah, there's definitely a few aspects of those questions. So it's how to get people to feel passion when it's so difficult to break the two-party system. There are many uh, internal disagreements, not only between people who are active party members now, but between people who could be. And so people are uh, perhaps wondering how that's going to turn out, because you're right, they need to be passionate. And so the question is, can they be passionate about a broad coalition, which sometimes might need to be a little bit careful uh, and less radical than people would like about certain issues, cer certain single issues that they are passionate about. Uh, and then there's also the problem of that probably, you know, a good majority of the people we uh, would like to attract do have a strong opinion about which of the two major parties are the lesser of two evils. Uh, so, or they're just apathetic and don't really want to become involved in a partisan movement at all. Well, it's not necessarily that they're apathetic, but they're alienated from political partisanship. Uh, so, so the media strategy's purpose is to uh, present messages in a way that will encourage people to actually get out there and start local chapters. Uh, so the, uh, you know, for example, James and I have, uh, uh, on this program, have been able to meet several times in Southern California along with others. And that definitely, I think, has encouraged both of us to become more active in the party. So, you know, clearly we need more of that, but it's hard for people to find each other without media strategy. Like we, we both, even though we live an hour away from each other, we, uh, we didn't know each other before until we got connected through finding the ASP on media articles or comment sections and, and connecting on Facebook. So there does need to be some of that media strategy. You know, as far as which issues could get people more passionate about Christian democracy and about the party, I think a, a general sense that we have a different view of organizing the economy on either party. Uh, you know, I think recognizing that labor and small business should not be enemies, that we should find ways of uh, uniting against the, uh, the, the large corporations, that environmental conservation is a part of this too, uh, that we need to continue to advocate on uh, you know, for life from conception to natural death, uh, ending abortion, assisted suicide. Uh, you know, we should, I think, more controversially, uh, try, try to, you know, instill some, some uh, traditional family values. Uh, we need to be welcoming of immigrants. We need to be anti-war. Uh, so, yeah, how, how to uh, continue to refine that message under some of those principles is uh, you know, going to be an ongoing challenge and to get people to want to advocate for that in their own communities. Mario, what do you have yes. to say about that? Well, I, um, I agree in general, uh, everything that you said, we need some means through which we can get uh, get to know each other and form these small communities which are the i think the starting point of any movement and my concern is precisely that in order to have a strong party we need to have a movement first and movement in this sense means a group of people who move is moved by an attraction an idea through the common good the social justice and feel passionate about this uh, set of ideals. And then uh, ultimately they set up the structure, the institution in this case would be the American Solidarity Party. So that when we just trust on the institution in order to grow, it seems that the institution cannot give that because it's not in its nature. The nature of a, any political party as a means through which we can achieve the common good is something that is feeding the, the institution. That's come, uh, let's say, prior to the institution, and that is a movement. So my, 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 <clears throat> my view is that uh, we need to start feeding these uh, people who may have different view about certain issues, 
But ultimately, there is an overriding passion that led them to, uh, to participate in a movement which ultimately may be, uh, be established in an institution like American Solidarity Party. And this passion also means be triggered by the rejection of the traditional party, which are completely schizophrenic, because generally, when you belong to this party, at least 50% of the policies there disagree with your own desire of the, of the, of the common good. So uh, I just was proposed, I mean, uh, just tried to say that in order to somehow steer the, the pot, so to speak. Right, that makes sense. All and right, that, now, Christy, know. Christy, in this whole business of passion and local organization, I know you've got a lot to say. I do, in fact, have a lot to say. So I guess my question would be, in a state as big as California, like in Maryland, it's pretty easy. You can throw a rock and hit someone in Maryland. Like, it's not, <laughs> it's not a large <laughs> state. How do you lead a state like California or a <clears throat> state where you can't always meet locally? Yeah, that's, uh, that's been a challenge. So in 2016, uh, I connected with Desmond on Facebook right after joining the party. Uh, Desmond Silvera, who was on the National Committee at the time and ended up running for governor. And I volunteered to help him set up a California chapter. And as part of that, I emailed everyone who had signed up by that point, including, I believe, uh, Jim here uh, might have been connected through that, uh, as well as Brian Carroll. I, I remember... Uh, getting the first email from uh, Brian Carroll, uh, where he had mentioned that he had uh, happened to be near the Democratic National Convention and had gone to protest there all by himself. And you know, I, I was so excited by that, you know, that these, you know, Brian and, and Jim and several other people happened to live uh, just a couple hours from me, not, not close enough to meet extremely regularly, but at least to try and set up some meetings. So uh, we decided to have a state convention that October after only a couple of months. Uh, we, we happened to work it out around uh, being near uh, my wife's family. Uh, we went to the convention and then we in San Luis Obispo and then went to my, uh, my wife's mom's birthday party. Uh, and so that happened to be in an area where both some uh, Northern California and some Southern California people were able to come, about a dozen. And uh, since then, unfortunately, the, the Northern California chapter has, has not been uh, quite as strong. But in Southern California, we do uh, have fairly frequent meetings, you know, at, at least a few times a year, of people who actually travel uh, a few hours to get there. And, and that's resulted in, like I said, the four, the four candidates running for office. All four of those candidates have been to my house at least once. Now, the, the problem is most people are not going to drive that long for a meeting. So how do how you get people in uh, specific counties to organize at the local level? And that's what's been more of a challenge. Uh, I know Jim has actually been able to have meetings with several people in Los Angeles, and I, I've tried to, to uh, get the word out. In I, I live in, in Ventura and uh, still uh, visit Santa Barbara a lot too, but it's been a significant challenge of actually moving toward real local organizations. That's going to be, uh, I hope that some members will have some, some ways of uh, reforming that and providing some suggestions about that over the next year, is that that's been a significant challenge throughout the country to to turn those in-person meetings of a few activists into real organizations. Christy, some follow-ups. I'm really like impressed by the dedication of people in other states. I always feel that way, especially when the March for Life and other protests in D.C., I can just metro in, and it's so easy, but other people, you know, they need to have some dedication, so I'm really inspired by that. 
<laughs> yes, it, it's it, it is really inspiring. And there there are other success stories that Amar Patel and Taiji Kuo in Chicago have set up uh, you know, community service opportunities, and that's actually I think in some cases gotten dozens of people out. Uh, the uh, Pittsburgh chapter in in Pennsylvania had had a bunch of meetings. Uh, a lot of people also try to visit other party members when they uh, travel out of town. Uh, and then, oh, of course, there's the Ohio chapter at uh, Midwest meeting is uh, is another one. Uh, the, the Texas chapter had a convention where I think some people travel pretty far to get there. Uh, so, yeah, we just need to turn that into uh, significant on the ground activity for it, especially for presidential ballot access. But I think intellectual uh, activity, intellectual workshops of some sort and service opportunities will be good too. And uh, I, I did just find someone who, you know, one of the challenges for state chapters is maybe somebody wants to organize locally, but doesn't want to be on their state committee. It's like, for example, I, I think I found someone for uh, New York City who might be in that position. So. The party has figured out some ways to allow people to do that. Let me uh, uh, make a couple of connections. At least I, I hope they oh, connect. Yeah. Oh, oh, before I mention, oh yeah, Grand Rapids, is, Michigan is another example of, of an in-person meeting where, where, Jim, I believe you have some, some connection as well, right? Yes, it's the Athens of the Midwest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not widely known, as, <laughs> not widely known as such, but yes. here are here are a couple thoughts that I, I I hope connect with what we're trying to get at. If we again turn to history, uh, we have different sorts of examples. Uh, why not start with uh, an American example? After all, we're talking about the American Solidarity Party. In terms of a party getting going and picking up momentum, I, I think we have to, to look at what happened just before the, the Civil War. We have, and, and Schuyler's the political scientist here, we have the uh, emergence of the, the Republican Party around uh, the question of, of slavery and what could be a more incendiary issue. And uh, at the same time, as, as we have the slavery dimension, we have this deep-seated economic uh, difference between the agrarian South and the industrial North. So those two things feed into each other. A at any rate, all of a sudden, there comes Abraham Lincoln. Now, two other comparisons that are much, much different. Uh, uh, one is, and it's a revolution that it could have gone many ways, but went terribly wrong. We have the uh, the communist revolution. How, how long was there uh, preparation for that? You could go back to the 1850s in Russia and find different groups, sometimes in communication, sometimes not, of what are now oftentimes lumped together as utopian socialists. And those early socialists really did a whole lot of thinking. And this is a controversial view, but my, my own view is that they did some better thinking than Marx ever did. Mm -hmm. but, but, but once again, you have this, this economic consideration and Marx would say, see, I told you so you have this profound struggle between industrialization and a more agrarian kind of life. And and that fuels the whole discussion. And now, still a third example. Uh, I don't think that anybody today sees the, the leadership of Israel as... as uh, 
enlightened and and uh, not only enlightened but serving somehow as a light unto the world. It, it, it's certainly not. But if you take the development of, of Zionism broadly understood, and Zionism doesn't have to be equated with a kind of distinct uh, imperialism, but if you take the development of Zionism, it, it takes place over decades and decades and decades. Uh, George Eliot, great novelist, and Daniel Deronda has uh, this fascinating combination of uh, close personal intimate relations being developed in the leisurely fashion of a Victorian novelist together with the development of Zionist thinking in, in Great Britain. And how long does it take for that to, to bear fruit? Uh, even though the fruit is bittersweet, how long does it take? It takes until after World War II. So a, a couple of thoughts that I, I bring from this. The, the American Solidarity Party does not have a, a natural economic base. We can't say, if you're in labor, you're with us. We can't say, if you're in business, you're with us. We can't say, if you're a farmer, you're with us. We, we don't have a natural, developed uh, 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 economic base. Right. By the same token, by the same token, we can... We can show the uh, the terrible impasse that our country has come to in economic matters, and we do have this. And I, I don't know. Be careful about what you pray for. We do have a country that is in a profound decline and a terrible spin, and the Lord knows what will come of it. And only the Lord knows what will come of it. And and we can be ready. We can be talking. We can have some principles. But if I were to fast forward two centuries, it wouldn't surprise me in the least if if we we were still then very much a minority party. But I, I hope that were that to happen, we'd be a minority party that still had these key, key principles on the other hand, fast forward two centuries, and in good grief, we might have made an enormous difference. But for for to go either way, we have to be. We have to first of all survive. We have to continue. And I think somebody like Skyler, somebody like Desmond, somebody like Christie, they keep us going, and that's the sine qua non. That's my first rant of the morning. Right. Hey. Yeah, it's it. I pretty much agree with that, and I think there's we provide a lot of people hope just because we're there, if nothing else. Uh, we've made good friendships, had lots of uh, very productive discussions, both online and offline. Uh, we get tired out by people who don't agree with us, and sometimes we get tired out by by uh, even people who who do agree with us, but we, we continue the struggle. And I really believe that this uh, 2020 presidential campaign, uh, regardless of how many votes we get, it, it's, it's going to be a productive part of the, the political conversation and hopefully, you know, pulling us back as a country toward the right values, at least reminding people of the right values. One of the the point, I think, going back to what uh, Jim said that we may um, emphasize is um, what is happening today, at least what is happening today, according to certain people, observers, journalists. Um, and I'm referring to those who share with us at least the experience of the Christian faith. And it is that in our uh, political system, particularly in our economic system, the what we may call pure economic libertarianism is um, not just um, delivering what it promised. So we are getting more and more alienated from the political, the economic system, and the divide between uh, rich and poor is getting uh, more profound. And that is uh, very 
easy to observe when you move from one big city to the Midwest. And so that system seems uh, to be failing to many people, the working class, if you want to use a term. But at the same time, people are tired, particularly uh, people, again, within this Christian experience about what is called uh, libertinism, which means uh, free ride in everything that has to do with, we may say, with life. So abortion on demand and everything in between. So if you just take these two perspectives today, or these two uh, dimensions today, people are warning that it's a, uh, a dead end, then we may have to these people a proposal to give, which means somehow we are not saying, or I'm not saying that we are trying to combine both or uh, have the proposal to uh, prevent those things to happening and you are, we are pro-life or we are not, uh, we are not completely um, uh, free market uh, marketeers, rather we are just for the common good. And so in that sense, the party is a proposal. But again, it's a proposal has no uh, ground on the, have no movement, have no contact with reality or at least social reality. And so perhaps we are witnessing right now the beginning of the uh, American Solidarity Party. We're just, we are the pioneers in some ways. But again, the party is leading to this awareness that is something wrong in the system. And the way that we have been going so far is not working. And it's not working only here. It's not working in many places around the world. And so I think that's something I, I would suggest uh, that need to take into uh, consideration. Right. Yeah, it's a challenge because you know, one problem we have is the the worst of both worlds. So we have you know, some huge government bureaucracies that, that don't work very well, which would appear to some to be more like socialism. And then we have this these cracks in the system where, where people fall through them unnecessarily, uh, which is like uh, libertarianism. Uh, it does seem like libertarianism is... You know, is the mo third most popular ideology behind the Democratic and Republican uh, main ideology, especially if if uh, Justin Amash runs for president. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see what happens, but uh, it clearly doesn't work. And we just have, I think, a few competing ideas within the party about what economic system would work better, you know, whether to focus more on building local communities or on uh, building up the uh, federal government programs, so, which don't necessarily need to be mutually exclusive. You know, it could very much well depend on, on which program. Uh, but that's, that's going to be a challenge to articulate. Christy, or what, what, what do you have to say now about this uh, whole business of, uh, what would we call it in, in uh, L.A., the breakout moment for the uh, Solidarity Party? What, what's needed? Or, or what can we do to figure out what's needed? Well, I'm excited for the breakout, I guess. Um, <laughs> I would think I think what's needed, which is kind of what, I don't know, I'm basing, I don't want to say it's a campaign. That sounds too serious. <laughs> I'm my run for national committee on is we need to reach millennials, which I think a lot of people, since we're so based on social media and online, I think there's a much different culture between like baby boomers or like, there's a generation between baby boomers and millennials, whatever that generation is <laughs> and millennials that I see a lot of like disconnect in the solidarity party and I think we really need to strengthen our outreach right yeah and it, it is concerning that we've had so we have a good college chapter at Catholic University of America uh, but we've had some 
trouble uh, attracting college students to be activists. Uh, there's the question about, there, there's a divide in the millennial generation, which I'm, I guess, at the older end of, about priorities. And so what, what might seem to attract certain millennials might might turn off others. So I, I guess you know, it'll be good to continue the discussion about, about uh, what that actually means. Well, Skylar, what about the outreach to minorities? Yes, that's uh, that's very important too. And I, I think it's probably going to take uh, a few people who who belong to minority communities uh, taking the lead on a lot of that outreach, and we definitely do have some. Uh, and then it will it'll it'll also take. Uh, what's going on here? Uh, as they sound, uh, it, it'll take outreach in various local communities uh, to minority communities, but also including at the outset people who are from those minority communities. Uh, they think it's not going to work well to just, you know, for a couple of, you know, non-minority activists to go to an event that's mostly minorities and preach about the party. There, there has to be some more creative thinking here. Let me uh, offer a uh, case study. Uh, of a local sort, if you could call Los Angeles local. Los Angeles County, by the way, the county is now the most populous county in the United States. About a week ago, just barely a week ago, the statistics came out on the number of homeless in the county and the number of homeless in the city. And after a year during which various uh, public agencies had spent, and I'm going to get close to, to being accurate, but you'll have to check the stats yourself. During a year in which various public agencies had spent in the neighborhood, how about that, of $550 million dollars dealing with questions uh, uh, about homelessness. After a year, this past year, $550 million spent, the number of homelessness in the county and the number of homelessness in the homeless in the city, both, had gone up greatly in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 percent. And People were stunned, at least the newspapers were stunned by this news. I doubt if people in homeless encampments were stunned. I think they recognized it perfectly well. Now, a couple of things come to mind. Two things. One, nobody really knows with any accuracy how many homeless people there are because these statistics come by way of volunteers going out and counting the homeless. Well, good grief, I think you'd have about as much luck in an accurate count of pigeons in Los Angeles as you would have in an accurate volunteer count of the homeless. But this whole business of how many people are homeless, that, that, that's one point. Another point is, surely, one of the reasons for the number of homeless is, is the terrible disintegration of family life. Now, there are other major reasons. A lack of affordable housing, uh, drug addiction, uh, mental illness. But, but all of these things, I think, connect in a very profound way with the destruction the ongoing destruction of family life, especially destruction of family life uh, among lower income people. And I don't think that the newspapers have the capacity, uh, the, the moral discipline 
to call this into account uh, for various reasons. One reason is that the the L.A. lifestyle as ballyhooed by the newspapers day after day after day after day utterly ignores the role of the family. And for that reason, I think we can't see or can't see clearly enough to talk about this profound contribution to this staggering increase in, in, in the homeless. We now have uh, in L.A. City around, I think the number was something like 57,000 plus a few hundred homeless yeah. people. I agree it, that the, it, you know, the family, you know, breakdown should be a focus. And if, if we could get it right, you know, the California Republican Party is in significant decline. It's Democratic supermajorities. Uh, you know, we could definitely become a, a significant force with you know, if, if things align the right way and if we have the right, you know, hard workers uh, getting it done. Uh, but yeah, I guess so for the last few minutes, I was going to talk about the uh, issues in the state legislature in California. With the, yes, yes, uh, the, please do, please do. Right, right. so uh, before I was uh, involved in the American Solidarity Party, I was writing my dissertation and, and did finish my doctorate uh, which was largely involving uh, Catholic lobbyists and how they deal with uh, legislative issues, especially poverty. Uh, so I was already interested in these sorts of topics. But in the last few months, actually before some of the most recent bills that are, are making the news, I had been in touch to some extent with the California Catholic Conference and the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Uh, that's part of networking. Uh, and so I, I have, you know, I think a good perspective on, on the, what the California Con Catholic Conference is trying to do in the state legislature. So, of course, the main bill is, which they're working on, is Senate Bill 360, which would uh, force priests to report uh, other priests uh, when they commit a crime, uh, even if it's uh, what they confess to them in the sacrament of confession. And actually a whole bunch of uh, the few remaining Republicans in the California State Senate voted for it too, in addition to all the Democrats. So now there's a misconception that this bill has already passed. Actually, it, it passed the State Senate and it's in a committee of the State Assembly. Uh, and so this is something where I think it does... Uh, align with the religious liberty part of the ASP platform to oppose it. Uh, and so many of us in the California chapter are working on that, trying to make calls and uh, get the word out to oppose this bill. Uh, Senate Bill 24, which is very concerning to me as an uh, alumni of a U University of California graduate program, uh, Senate Bill 24 has also passed the state Senate and is in, is in an assembly committee. And it would uh, uh, make it so that the UC and CSU health systems would uh, provide abortions. Uh, so we, de we definitely oppose that as a, a ASP state chapter. Uh, the California Catholic Conference, even as they're dealing with these two, you know, really significant bills, uh, that would have you know profound you know negative effects for for our, our culture. Uh, the California Catholic Conference tends to be more toward I would say a center left Democrats on economic issues, and there are several bills that they're supporting, including uh, increasing the eligibility for earned income tax credit in California, a uh, plan to solve child poverty and uh, making sure that pregnant and parenting students know their right, uh, you know, for that, that uh, whole life perspective to, to uh, combat abortion. Uh, and so I would say it's, you know, the American Solidarity Party, and I think especially the California chapter, maybe as a pilot program, should try to get more involved in promoting state legislation. And the California Catholic Conference endorsements are overall a pretty safe bet. Uh, yeah, I would say, you know, we should, you know, it's, we're not a Catholic party and 
it's understandable why a lot of Catholics even for for various reasons are are unsure about the the National Catholic Conference or the California Catholic Conference. But I would say that their legislative efforts, which and, and by the way, there's actually a lot of uh, women who were involved in Catholic lobbying at that level when it comes to to Catholic legislative networking. Uh, they they have a very solid understanding of Catholic social teaching and really try to get at both the issues that make us more conservative as a party and the issues that make us more progressive as a party uh, uh, fairly well. Uh, definitely a good source of information. Yes. Well, Mario and Christy, last thoughts? I have a, I don't know, a quick question. Um, I heard, uh, and I think it's not only in California, I think it's nationwide that the family is in crisis. And that affects the economy of the family. And that has a very um, salient uh, uh, influence on Hispanic families. It's not only Anglo families or minority families. Right. So generally in the second generation, uh, many Hispanic families fall apart, but not in the first generation, which is very, very solid and they work together and they make it, uh, they are very, um, uh, very, uh, I don't know, very strong. Now, the question is, uh, what it would be then the role of the American Solidarity Party to strengthen these uh, families, to give this family the hope that they need to be together? Is there any policy, any way that this uh, political party can announce to those families that stay together is the better, is the best policy? Yeah, that's or, a, is, or, excuse me, or is that the role of a political party? That's my question. Yeah, that's that's a challenging question. The uh, the political party as an organization uh, is probably can't do very much unless we start really becoming a, a more civic organizations in local communities that that does service projects of some sort or provide or become such a strong social network that party that families would actually uh, you know go to the party as one of their na main friendship networks when they're having problems I mean that could happen uh, but I guess a lot of this you know gets to some of the internal difficulties in our party and so it, as one Catholic bishop mentioned is it family is it family breakdown that leads to poverty, or is it poverty that leads to family breakdown? Uh, obviously, there, there's some of both. So the question is, you know, do we really want to get into the territory of, of making it, of disincentivizing divorce? Uh, do we really want to focus on decreasing economic stresses? I, I think there, there could be, you know, parts of the answer in both, but we also need to to not make it all about one thing. And, uh, you know, there, there's always going to be, uh, you know, exceptional circumstances that, you know, we can't always make the exceptional circumstances, uh, you know, the reasons for our policy. Like, yes, we want to prevent a divorce, but we also want to, uh, in, in, so we get that at the same time we want to prevent ab abuse while we're preventing divorce, but but preventing divorce is still is still a good overall. Uh, and yeah, and I agree that the Hispanic family is uh, you know definitely something to to continue to uh, keep watch over, and you know I especially have an interest in that. Uh, a lot of my political identity was, uh, you know, formed. You know, I, I grew up as a Democrat, converted to to Catholicism. You know, became more seriously about pro life, and it, I was in a, a largely Hispanic, uh, Catholic community at, at at my graduate school. And so the the you know, devout you know I would say conservative leaning Catholic Hispanics, uh, 
you know, were a great influence on on, on me, and uh, I definitely want to. Uh, I, I definitely think they can be a, a major part of our coalition. Christy, last thought from you. Oh golly, well, I'm really excited about where the ASP is going. I'm. Really happy to talk to you today, Skylar. Thank you, Chrissy. I'm excited about our elections coming up. Yeah. So I vote. Yes, that's for sure. Get get your get your thoughts out there by voting. Uh, we'll end now, as as we have the past several weeks, with uh, a prayer in the form of the gospel from today's liturgy. This is from the gospel according to John. After Jesus had revealed himself to his disciples and eaten breakfast with them, he said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon Peter answered him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. He then said to Simon Peter a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon Peter answered him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was distressed that he had said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Amen, amen, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to dress yourself and go where you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. He said this, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had said this, he said to him, follow me, the gospel of the Lord. Thanks to all our participants this morning. And we'll be back with another podcast next week. Take care. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.